Welcome to the, to the workshop this afternoon. Um, today's workshop is sharing best practices in open science training from online to hybrid and beyond. Uh, good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Helen Clare and I'm from GIS and I'll be facilitating today along with colleagues Irina uh, from Eiffel and Open Air and Venkat. So welcome. Before we go any further to see the programme for today, I'd just like to give an, a quick introduction just to the organisers of, of today's workshop and the sort of the background. You can move the slide, please, Venka. There we go, we got there in the end. First of all, the workshop is being um, facilitated by the Open Science Training Coordinators Community of Practice. This community was set up in 2018 by Open Air. Open Air still has a strong supportive role, but it is very much own, owned and driven by members. We have nearly 100 members um, of the community and they come from um, pr projects, research infrastructures and institutions, all of whom have, have a role either in delivering or coordinating uh, training. We meet regularly to share practice. We have monthly meetings where we usually have a presentation and from one of our members followed by discussions and working groups. We have several working groups at the moment. We actually had one task force to, to prepare for the sessions here at this conference. We also have another on um, FAIR training materials and our members do contribute to a wide range of different projects. So if you're interested in getting involved, please do see the information there or drop Irina a line but we've got many members on the call and helping out with facilitation today. Next, please. Also involved in, in delivering today's session, we've got people who are involved in the Reimagining Educational Practices for Open Project, REPO. This is a project that's been funded by Alfred Sloan and is uh, led by Force 11, but it has participants from around the globe in terms of uh, coming together to try and, and understand and normalize open scholarship practices, both training, but also culture change. And we're particularly focusing on uh, developments post COVID. So we have a range of activities, including dialogue with the open science community. We also have a survey, which you'll have the links for later on gathering emerging best practices and training. And we're producing a range of tools to map and support uh, community and training development. So again, please do, do get involved if you're interested in that community. Next, please. Finally, um, I'll just mention EOSC Synergy. I'm working on EOSC Synergy. It's a European Open Science Cloud project. Uh, like many EOSC, uh, EOSC projects, we have training elements. We're producing training. Uh, one thing we are producing in our uh, project is an Open Science Training Handbook. So we're trying to gather together good practice and share that good practice specifically in delivering training online. And I should say that was one of our goals uh, right from the start of the project before COVID uh, even came along, but obviously um, it's made uh, our outputs a lot more relevant. So ideally we, we really do want to, to include uh, the outputs of this workshop in the handbook and we've made it open today for viewing and for commenting. And again, those links will be available after today. So that's the background. We've got an awful lot of people and organisations interested in delivering uh, open science training online. Before that, we were doing it face to face and obviously um, increasingly now we're starting to return to face to face and perhaps move to a hybrid environment. So how can we gather those practices and support each other and share experience? Next slide, please. So that's the background to today's workshop. Um, in terms of the programme, so we're starting off with the introduction and then we'll have about three short talks, so around half an hour, um, from different members of the community, sharing their experiences, particularly of open science uh, online training. We're then gonna have a breakout sessions where you'll get to, to talk to each other, share experience, we'll feed that back and come back to, to summarize the next steps for where we can, how we can best use uh, the information we've gathered today. So before we go any further, just wanted to, to see if we could find out a little bit more about you. And I, I think I'm gonna hand over to Irina to, to navigate the Zoom polling, if you're ready. <laughs> yes. Um... 
just a second. While we're waiting, I'll just post the, the link to our collaborative notes document in the chat. And then we've also got, uh, which contains the link to the presentation that you're seeing today. So we've got our first questions come up. Um, well, we've got them all at once. We'd just like to, to answer them all just to, to see whether you run training, whether you run open science training, and what your experience of open science online training particularly has been so far. So let's see how this goes. Most of us have been using Menti recently for, for these questions. So we, we switched to, to Zoom polls for technical reasons. So it'd be interesting to see how this goes. Can you see anything at your end, Irina? Or, or is anybody answering? Yes, 67%, 69, 72. 74%, let's maybe give us a minute. Uh, yeah. 76, yeah. 79, shall I end, Paul? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you summarize that for us? Yes, I'm oh, sharing results. Um, as you can see, most of us uh, run trainings and uh, open science trainings. Uh, some plan to, and some respond. It depends what you mean by open science. Um, and um, for experiences, uh, I guess 39% uh, said still trying to work out the best way to train online. And then we have some who said really well, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And also a steep learning curve, but it went well in the end. That's also useful. Yeah, yes, and then all, mm -hmm. yeah, please, please. I, I think we wanted to say the same, never again. <laughs> so yes, we've got, we got a mix. <laughs> it would be good to hear. As usual with these that. sessions, we, we've got quite a mix, which, which will be great for when we come to the discussion and, and sharing. But um, can't wait to hear about the person who said never again. <laughs> OK, we move on. So we're going to move into the first part of, of the session today, which is, is hearing from um, some colleagues who have delivered training and agreed um, to share their experiences with us. So we have three presenters. We've got uh, Samuel Simango from Stellenbosch University, Louisa Bengtsson um, from the Max de Brooks Center, Center for Molecular Medicine, and Ellen Neonarts from Dance. So for our first talk, Samuel, are you ready? If we can hand over. We, we've allocated about uh, between five and seven minutes um, for these talks, if that's okay. And I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick shout at around six minutes to go. It's when you've got a minute to go, if that's, that's okay with you. All right, it's fine. All right, um, can we move on to the starting slide, please? Um, am I audible, by the way? Okay, great. Um, so my presentation is primarily about the um, research data management adventure game. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide. Um, so the game is basically a, a collab. Oh, geez, um, slide back. Just the previous one. Uh, the game is basically a collaboration between the University of Bath. Uh, thank you very much. Between the University of Bath and Stellenbosch University, the Artemis Adventure Game is a text-based role-playing interactive fiction uh, series game based on the data management challenges of an academic research project. The game takes the form of an online choose-your-own-adventure format in which game players take a simulated research project through the following processes: data management, planning data collection or generation, data organization, data description, and research publication whilst encountering data management challenges along the way. The game itself was developed as part of a collaboration between the University of Bath Library and Stellenbosch University's Library Information Service. 
Next slide, please. The RDM adventure game was developed from 2017 to 2017 by Alex Ball from the University of Bath, myself, and Ashwat Khan from the University of Bath, uh, but now she's at University College London. The game was launched by the University of Bath in December 2020 and by Stonebosch University in March 2021. Next slide, please. The objective of the RDM adventure game is to demonstrate, if not actually teach, good research practice in RDM. The game was designed to assist researchers to understand good practices of research data management. The specific learning outcomes are focused on the following aspects, data management planning, designing participant information sheets and consent forms, choosing appropriate equipment for research projects, acquiring suitable third-party research data, organizing research data, storing research data appropriately, analyzing and documenting research data, preparing research data for archiving, as well as publishing research data. Next slide, please. The RDM Adventure Game is aimed primarily at postgraduate students as well as early career researchers. However, anyone who has a vested interest in understanding how research data management works on a practical level could find the game to be beneficial. For example, research support staff. Next slide, please. And so far as the gameplay is concerned, the game takes players through different stages of the research data lifecycle, presents them with a data management challenge, and allows them to make decisions that affect the success of their research projects. Players progress either by making straightforward binary choices or by completing something more puzzle-like. In the process, certain challenges test the effectiveness of the decisions made by the players. The tone of the game has been kept lighthearted so as to maintain its entertainment value. Next slide, please. Since the game simulates the entire research data management lifecycle, the repercussions for the decisions which researchers make can be experienced in a safe environment, thus permitting researchers to make mistakes and hopefully learn from them without suffering the associated real life consequences. Game players can opt to play the entire game or they may select to play only one specific stage of the research data management lifecycle. Next slide, please. So exactly how can the game be used? Uh, next slide, please. There are two use cases. Firstly, virtual training, through which game players can play the game synchronously on their own. Or secondly, interactive training. This is a form of synchronous training that blends orthodox research training methods with game-based learning aspects. Under such circumstances, the game would serve as a summative evaluation tool. Next slide, please. The RDM Adventure Game is freely available. The game's source code has been released under a Creative Commons license and is hosted on GitLab. Since it is an online game, the RDM, RDM Adventure Game can be accessed if a person has an internet connection and a web browser. Progress during the game is saved to a web browser cookie. As such, it is possible for players to stop playing the game, return later, and resume from where they left off, provided that they do not clear the cookies in their web browsers. Next slide, please. As of the 20th of September, 2021, the game has been played by 1,121 people in 58 countries. The key barrier to accessibility that exists at the moment is the language barrier. The game is only available in English. However, some interest has been received to have the game translated into other languages, such as French and Spanish. Subsequently, the game's build system was updated in order to accommodate different versions of the game in these other languages, or in fact, any other language for that matter. Next slide, please. The RDM adventure game represents a fun way to teach necessary skills that are required in order to adhere to resource data management best practices. Even though the game's core focus is resource data management, when considered from a general perspective, it can be observed that the game supports initiatives such as the fair data principles, as it educates game players on how they can ensure that resource data are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Next slide, please. In addition to the above, the game also directly promotes open science, more specifically, open access, open data, and open reduce, uh, reproducible initiatives. It attempts to teach researchers to ensure that their research data can be eventually disseminated in an open manner. This would be expected to have spillover effects as open accessible scientific research data reduce barriers of access particularly those related to costs. Ultimately, this should help to promote the idea of scientific research as a public good, especially if such research data has been 
publicly funded. I mean, sorry, such research has been publicly funded. Uh, next slide, please. Now, since its launch, the RDM Adventure Game has received several noteworthy endorsements. In December of 2020, the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud added the RDM Adventure Game on its training discovery toolkit. Next slide, please. In January of 2021, the Wellcome Trust Early Career Researchers Advisory Board endorsed the game by including it in the Wellcome Open Research Early Career Researchers Pack, thereby recognizing it as a useful tool for researchers. Next slide, please. In May of 2021, the Open Research Funders Group endorsed the Research Data Management Adventure Game by adding it to the list of resources on the organization's policy implementation tools webpage. Next slide, please. As I indicated um, at the beginning, this was a collaborative um, effort. So if anyone would, um, can skip that slide um, and just get to the last one, which is basically about more information about the game. That's the link to the game as well as the source code. And if anyone would like to contact me or my colleagues who helped me um, to develop the game, or my collaborators rather, um, here are our contact details um, on the final slide. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. If there are any questions for Samuel, please do put your hand up or ask them in the chat. A very short question, if I may. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was just not clear to me when you showed the figures of how many times the game was played since when uh, do you count these numbers? Um, so we started counting them from the time that um, the University of Bath actually um, launched the game. So the game was launched officially on the 4th, but it could be accessed, I think, from the 2nd, just before the launch. So we actually look at the stats starting from the 1st of December. Um, December. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Great. Right. Thanks, Samuel. Are you staying on for the rest of the session so people can ask questions? Yeah. Okay. Our next speaker was due to be Louisa Bengson, but we can't see her in the in the room at the moment. So we're planning to to move skip over to Ellen, who's kindly agreed to to bring her slot forward. Hopefully we can we can fit Louisa in when she return when she arrives. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the first slide about uh, work package six in the shock project, which is an European project that will end. Um, I think it was April next uh, year, so uh, we've we've had quite some time now to to deliver the tasks that we need to do and um, sharing uh, some of our experiences now today. So uh, these specific experiences in the shock project are from work packet six task six point four, which is a team of course. So I'm 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 just a speaking person and. Um, 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 and um, the the slides are also created collaboratively. Just to mention that. I think next slide. Yeah. So the 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 training activities that we're talking about today are not uh, all the training uh, activities in in Work Packet Six because there are also lots of webinars and workshops um, done. But uh, I focus now on the boot camps that we uh, were supposed to do and uh, on the training community and on uh, the challenges and tips that we see from going online to hybrid. And we dare not touch the beyond <laughs> because then I'm thinking like avatars and artificial intelligence and I'm just dreaming. So I'm gonna go that far. So next slide, please. So uh, what we... Um, uh, but we're supposed to organize within uh, task 6.4 where three face-to-face -face boot camps that were a one and a half day um, co-organized with local partners um, and co-hosted at conferences. And uh, what, it, what is done um, already in a good way 
let's say from the beginning in the shock project before COVID was that everyone, everything needs to be reported very, very carefully. So things should be in Zenodo or things should be um, reported in deliverable. So actually we, at the moment we are working on the deliverable on the boot camps. So that will be published soon as well. Anyhow, when we moved online, we had to think about how to do this because we, we were supposed to uh, do face-to-face -face boot camps, you know, boot camps in a way like we are working with trainers, train the trainer boot camps, we are working with trainers, doing some pedagogical work, but also some content work, uh, sitting together in, in rooms, talk to each other, uh, things like that. And how do you do that when you move online? Um, so there were some things that changed. We, we changed from one and a half days, of course, to uh, one session, which was a, let's say, a, a morning. And then later on, the boot camps uh, grew into multiple sessions. So every boot camp was uh, at least two sessions with some days in between. And we moved from co-hosted from with the training community, our own training community to conferences but also stand alone because when you are online, you don't need the people to be there somewhere. You can just, you know, everyone is online. I mean, most people are, so you don't need to organize a bootcamp next to a conference. Um, so a couple of bootcamps that were organized uh, always with uh, research infrastructures involved and, um, and specific institutes. We also had uh, quite some uh, input from the trainers from Fair is Fair. And of course, we had uh, additional focus on, on how to present what we wanted to do in those uh, boot camps. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so what uh, we, we already faced in the beginning and, and saw that that's happening is online fatigue. And, uh, and, and a colleague uh, just mentioned the, what, what did you need? Oh yeah, Zoom B. So maybe you all recognize that feeling even uh, today at this time. Uh, anyhow, so we decided to, to only present the boot camps in short sessions. So two hour sessions or maximum two and a half uh, days in between. And in those days in between, we, we offered to, um, to do exercises. These exercises people would mostly do uh, on their own. Uh, but then collaboratively go through them in the in the second day. Also during the bootcamp, we made sure that we did some interactive elements like we do today with, with breakouts, of course, but also uh, also with polling and also a kind of energizing intermezzos. Um, yeah, I, I said about yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, I think this is very good to have when you uh, uh, when you want to look at what was it all about. So you can have a look uh, at this slide later. There's the resources where you can find them, the topics, and also people what people thought about it. So next slide, slide please. So what worked well? I think it was very inclusive, and we all recognize this. We don't. We didn't have to pay uh, such large conference fees, uh, travel, hotel no uh, carbon footprint, etc. cetera. Uh, but I think what, what So we did feel that um, this is a kind of, um, uh, yeah, this is an issue. Um, and because we more and more organize, uh, events are organized, people have less focus. They just register and then at the last moment they don't show up or they, they show up at the first meeting, but then they didn't have time to do the exercise and then skip the second meeting. And then again, if you have this, small group, then, uh, then this could be uh, an issue. So, but we also, I think what we, we also decided that we needed to, to put 
more efforts on, let's say, the training community. That was also one of the tasks in the, in the um, uh, shock project. Next slide. Do you see the next slide or is it just me? Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, so this training community, it's its a bit like the community of practice, but this is for trainers in the social science and humanities. We do monthly calls and it's very, really informal. And this is also um, uh, raising commitment when you uh, organize, uh, well, that's one of, the, one of the goals to have more uh, interaction uh, that you would normally do next to the boot camps or when you are in a conference then you have this informal chats near the coffee machine and this is uh, supposed to be a, a bit like that you you we, um share Ellen, Ellen. yeah sorry you said one minute to go ah okay <laughs> um so let's go to the next slide and i think that's the the one that <laughs> that you want to see Challenges from online to hybrid and beyond. Um, I think that uh, we we think, but uh, I don't know what you think, but we think that online will stay because it does have quite a few advantages. Um, and we will become quite bored with all the engaging online events that we, the, how it is now. So we need to be creative, uh, stay creative uh, because otherwise uh, it will, it, yeah, we think that uh, it becomes less effective. So one of the examples of uh, of online uh, training course that uh, that I, I'm currently organizing is that we uh, organize it with a kickoff. So uh, first the kickoff for one and a half hour, then a lot of work, uh, homework, and uh, second session, and then a third session doing all the breakouts. But then you, we hope to keep the commitment. So one of the things I think we with hybrid is that hybrid is actually face-to-face -face next to online. And then it, the real challenge is how to make sure that the learning outcomes are achieved online as well as the online audience, as well as the face-to-face -face audience. That it's not just to listen in. We don't want that. We, want, we, we really want to achieve the same, same goals. How do you do that? Um, we also think that you can have quite a creative mix of face-to-face uh, -face and online meetings. So combine uh, uh, the three, the two. And um, I think we can learn a lot from Australians and Africans. So we need to look at those, <laughs> them too. Um, they probably have organized it more than we did. So, And we think that, well, technically and moder moderation wise, um, there's still a lot to be learned until we can organize successful hybrid events. At least we thought hybrid is, is a challenge. It's the next challenge, actually. Yeah. That was Thanks, it. Ellen. Brilliant. Thanks, Ellen. So any questions for Ellen, please put, put them in the chat. But we're pleased to say that Louisa has made it. So Venka, if you can uh, flip back to, to Louisa's slides now, that would be great. Hi, Louisa. Hello, I'm sorry. I'm actually doing one of the last and first since two years face-to-face -face workshop on open space. Oh, okay. And it took a bit longer, so I had to run out. But anyways, I'm here. And um, okay, I would like to present then the Orion project and the training on open science we did in the Orion project. Um, Helen, you have the slides, right? Uh, yeah, Ben Katz will be putting them up shortly. So the Orion project was funded by the European Commission in 2017. Uh, that was a, a huge project uh, that's ending this month, actually. So this is the very, very last minutes of the Orion project. And we in Berlin, in Germany, at Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine, we had the work package training. And this is what we have done with that. Next slide, please. So we have delivered online and offline, primarily offline, and then after two years, we started with online for uh, clear reasons, um, training on open science and responsible research innovation uh, across Europe. So this is the, the countries in the radar where we've been, so, so to say, in person and actually 
delivered the training. Our target audiences were yeah, um, early career researchers, so PhDs, but also postdocs, also PIs, policy makers, and science managers. Next slide, please. Um, yeah. So what we have done was first uh, live workshops, so meaning basic synchronous participation. So we had our participants either in a room or in a Zoom room. And what um, we have done, full day workshops, half day workshops, uh, but also just lectures at conferences and different other interventions. Next. Uh, what we also have done are uh, MOOCs two different MOOCs. Um, one was on uh, open science in on specific on topic in on topics in life sciences. And this was a uh, six week course, which uh, basically amounted to pretty much three hours work a week, most of it self paced, but with frequent uh, group um, exercises that were uh, done synchronously online. And then there was all the chat and we were also moderating the the discussions, so the participants were basically, we were guiding them through the course in a live version. Now this MOOC is converted to a self-paced version and can be found on uh, Open Learn Create, uh, so Open University uh, Moodle platform. And also all the resources we created are also on Zenodo anyways. Uh, we also have done a train the trainer MOOC. Uh, this also ran live. Uh, there we used the Berlin Science Week that was happening at the end of the, train the trainer course and we had the participants participating actually in the Berlin Science Week and delivering what they have learned about open science in an open science cafe at the Berlin Science Week. Um, also this course is now on open learn create and additionally what we've been doing we've done two full seasons of a open science podcast where we used the podcast format to actually find out more from experts about different topics on open science and really topics ranging from public engagement really hardcore data, algorithmic biases, uh, policy issues, uh, publishing, everything. Uh, basically the whole open science um, universe we tried to cover in the podcast. Um, we had over 7,000 downloads, uh, which we, it's not the world for the podcast, but we're quite proud of it for such a niche topic in a way. And uh, we think that podcasting actually is a very nice format to learn something about open science and definitely we, as the podcast hosts and producers, learned a lot in the process and could use that knowledge to, to um, design and deliver our trainings. Next slide, please. Uh, and yeah, so everything's on Zenodo. So um, um, can you just please click? I <laughs> think my colleague made the animation. I'm not really sure what's coming, but okay. Uh, so basically everything is on this open learn create model and also in Zenodo. And uh, it's also described what's in there. So free to use for everybody. It's all under CC BY license. Next slide, please. Next one. Yeah. Okay. What we also have done, um, not too, too far, too far. One back, one back, please. Okay. So what we also have done is uh, actually a scientific analysis of what's actually offered as open science training in um, life science institutions across Europe. And for that, we used um, as a data source the, EU, the institutes of the EU Life Alliance, where we analyzed basically what kind of professional continued professional development programs are there for in graduate schools, but also for postdocs and PIs on, and which um, and what elements of open science are in those courses. So that was a basically gap analysis, which we conducted in 2018. And we're now also finishing the comparison to that uh, from 2021 uh, program. Um, I, we don't have the, we haven't completed the analysis yet, but so much I can say a lot has happened. It was three years, maybe also due to pandemic. And we, what we also have done, because we were curious about, okay, how can we actually, I mean, it's nice that we have all these European projects, we've developed all this training, but how do we actually get it on the actual graduate school curricula, where it needs to be part of the curriculum? And for that, uh, we conducted a qualitative analysis where we interviewed different um, uh, managers of graduate schools, how they actually, uh, how do they actually conceive those curricula? And the results of this two, um, two research projects are now currently being written up and we're hoping to submit um, the paper next week before the Orion ends, basically. Um, and uh, there are some interesting insights from there. Okay, next slide. 
And the last one, this is the team behind the training for Orion. So uh, Zoe Ingram, the educational scientist who was mainly responsible for the uh, gap analysis and the, and the uh, quality of research. Uh, Inga Patachit joined us. She's a data specialist and Emma has been along the way. She created the MOOCs and uh, we together conceived most of the podcasts and the trainings. So that's it from me. Thank you so much, Louisa. I just popped in the chat. I found the Train the Trainer MOOC really useful. And then talking to Emma as part of the Synergy project, it was, it was really useful. Uh, we have a question in the chat, um, which is, have you attempted to follow up with participants of the different learning event types to see what gives the best retention rates over time? So this is a very interesting question as any impact assessment. <laughs> um, yeah, um, difficult. So what we've been doing in the trainings was um, we've been collecting. So one last activity in every training, we had individual action plans. So we always ask the participants, basically, can you please write down for yourself, if you want to you can present it for others, um, what you're going to do in terms of something for open science in the next day, in the next week, next month, uh, next year, something like that. And then uh, Zoe has actually been collecting this data. And we intended to follow up on that. Um, but to be honest, uh, the data is interesting in itself, um, but we have no means to follow up on that. That's the, that's the problem. But this would be actually quite good uh, assessment of the impact, like to actually see the participants who were there a year ago, did they actually do any of that that were thinking after the course that they would be doing? What we know for sure from the from the MOOC, from the Life Sciences, um, Open Science Life Sciences MOOC, is that there were several participants who got that back to us with the feedback and saying, oh, I was just writing my grant proposal and I could totally use um, what I've learned to make a better grant proposal. Oh, now I understand data management. So we have this kind of feedback, but it's not structured. So it's not a proper impact assessment. Great. Thank you so much, Louisa. It's worth mentioning that the final conference is next week and still yes. open for booking, I believe. So we've got the link later on. Are you staying with us, Louisa, or do you, do you need to die? I'm sorry, I have to run back to no, the that's, workshop. No, that's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you but so much for joining us. If you have us. any questions, please just write to me. Um, I'm still there. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still at MDC and still be doing it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. And thanks to our other speakers um, as well for everyone keeping very well to time. So we'll move straight in now into the, uh, the breakout sessions. So we've got uh, a few experiences there already from different, different um, trainers about, about delivering, training in different ways, online, hybrid, et cetera. So now we'd really like you to, to talk to each other about, about your experiences and hopefully as we go through we'll, we'll gather uh, those experiences as well. So what we've Is it just me or Helen Frost? Yeah, um, I, I didn't hear her. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about the same. Here. Oh, please, I've switched same my thing. camera on. Same thing happened earlier when Ellen was speaking. Sorry, is it must be by connection. That's unusual. Am I still there? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll keep my camera. Yeah, well, uh, please. Well, if it happens again, take over, Irina. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, we are breaking into groups. Uh, we'll automatically assign you to groups and we'll have a facilitator who will report back. Uh, we have a set of collaborative notes documents. So um, each group can, can take notes in their own individual groups. And we just like you to, to cover topics such as, you know, your background, what your experience is, the challenges that you may face moving online, what worked, what didn't, and, and what perhaps your future looks like in terms of training. Irina, do you want to, to do the, the honors with the breakout groups now? <laughs> mm. Yeah, and maybe to add that uh, we want to publish a blog post together with you, or maybe some recommendations, documents, so those discussions are not just for our curiosity, but that, that's also something that we want to uh, describe and, and share with the community and hope you don't mind that, sir. So I'm creating five breakout rooms and uh, if by chance all uh, facilitators end up in, in the same room, uh, please, uh, come back to the main session and I'll assign you to, to your room. Um, 
we're, we're planning to, to to have a discussion for 30 minutes so just over so we'll, we'll come back at uh, quarter to the hour so you should see breakout rooms popping up already and Hey, um, we just got about 15 minutes to do, do some feedback from the groups. I was in group three, so I'll, I'll feedback from there. Who was group one? Oh, there were six of us and uh, we, we discussed uh, one specific case uh, on um, how to organize uh, a one and a half hour training for early career researchers. So we spent some time talking about that, and um, then uh, we focused on uh, online versus uh, hybrid versus face-to-face, -face, and we all agreed that uh, online is much more inclusive and democratic, uh, and um, probably face-to-face -face will only be specific to like really specific learning outcomes or uh, objectives. Uh, so we, we didn't really follow the, the structure, but I think it was a good conversation. And please, what colleagues, if, if you want to add anything. Are there any key issues that came up that you, you want to highlight, sort of either things that worked or things that didn't, sort of online? Yeah, it, did, it worked well for senior researchers. Yeah, Hugh, please. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it was kind of interesting the level of enthusiasm to switch to say, yeah, let's keep on doing online. Uh, so Katie Yates, you know, you made the point about that the SGFC is really, really scattered. It's really practical to actually do stuff which is being 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 done online. Uh, I think Malika also made the the point that. Um, uh, if it, you know, if somebody is turns up to this and it's not terribly interested then they don't um uh you know they, they don't just don't engage and while if they did face to face then they'd be shuffling about being generally a bit of a pain to be to be honest so actually that's a that's quite a that's quite a a, a good thing that that was there um arena also gave this link to this passport for open science which might which which also might be it might be of, of, of interest there i think it's everything they come to Great, and thanks. Laurence is on the call and she developed that passport for open science. Okay, is there anything else from group one? We'll move on. I think we can move on. Group two? Yeah, I can, um, I can just go over this. Um, thanks, Deborah. If you don't mind opening it. <laughs> um, I just, uh, yeah, rediscovered the joys of trying to take notes whilst engaging in a discussion and um, to be honest like I've been on maternity leave for most of the pandemic and we did most of our training um, in person despite being um, a digital repository of Ireland so I'm rediscovering yet yeah, trying to collaborate whilst also have a good discussion. Um, as you can see from the discussion uh, the notes here um, we spent quite a lot of time introducing ourselves um, and yeah, hearing about our diverse backgrounds and experiences. Um, and then some of the issues um, relating to the conversation topics came up as part of the introduction. So of course that issue of being um, forced to go online by COVID rather than choosing to do so and having to um, adapt to that method and learn quite quickly. Uh, that's certainly something we experienced at the Digital Repository of Ireland. Um, so yeah, um, some of the challenges of moving online, um, Maggie, um, who's in London, Sweden, um, asked how can you promote that kind of same level or a similar level of interactivity in online events? Um, so yeah, we've all experienced that issue of people being afraid to say something stupid um, when working online. Um, we of course have that issue in person as well of people who are quieter and those people who prefer to speak, but 
of course, um, in Zoom, people can turn their cameras and mics off and it can be quite unnerving um, for the person running the training workshop. Um, Catherine uh, said they'd struggled with that and there is the option of insisting on keeping cameras on. Um, that could be, um, people might not like to do that um, as a trainer or a participant, but um, that was argued as an, an option there. Um, and there are different um, tools that can take the focus off individuals, um, such as collaborative note taking. Um, does anyone else want to jump in from my group like, and actually offer their own perspective on this? Um, I don't want to speak for everyone. I think our, our discussion focused on engagement and, and the, the fear and the reality of participants not being engaged. I, I, I think Maggie told everyone's horror story. You do an online training and no one has their camera on and you don't even know if they're there. And what do you do now? <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, I, I'll feed back from group three. Uh, again, we did a similar thing. We just had a lot of our introductions and a lot of uh, practice came out in those introductions. We, some of the, the challenges that we highlighted were things around, around the interactivity, which it just been mentioned. We had exactly the same conversation about the cameras and knowing if somebody's there or not, um, and, and about the issues around whether you can enforce it or not. Uh, we also had quite a lot of discussion about actually actual attendance and booking, you know, the fact that, that so many courses now that people just book and you never know who's going to turn up and how many and, and various different mechanisms that each of us had tried to, to address that, uh, not very successfully, unfortunately. We also had a, a conversation around uh, pricing. So most of us, I think, run, tend to run free training, but so, some do charge and, and how do you identify what makes value how do you what what price do you pitch it at and how do you show the value of, of that um in the not online audience we had a discussion around resources and equity so the idea that you know ensuring that, that different people who come on the, the course uh the training can actually make the most of it so while it, it does open up opportunities for people in all different countries and different backgrounds to attend not everyone has the same um, resources and equipment to be able to to make the most of that so again different steps that you can take through pre-recording providing transcripts etc to to allow people to access the resources beforehand um yeah and I, I think that's a, a general summary but you can see our detailed notes if there's anything anybody else wants to highlight Got a couple of things coming up in the chat, so I'll just I'll just check that. Um, Eleni has to leave. Bye. And uh, the carpentries, uh, Hugh was mentioning, they have a, a good idea about dealing with the wall of icons problem that we all have. Yeah. So, so Maggie, actually, Maggie just linked it, the, the the link to it on uh, uh, just a, up ahead. And one idea that sort of that that thing about you know complete silence, you know, you're talking to a blank wall, uh, was actually uh, to ask for nominees, to ask for one or two people to say, look, can, can you, I, to do my teaching, I, I need to see some faces. So to ask for one or two volunteers to say, please leave your video on, just so I can see, you know, somebody <laughs> to, to focus on. That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm always the nodder, the nodder in workshops. <laughs> Maggie. Yeah. yeah, just to say that the, with the carpentries, they, they, in their pedagogics, so there is also a lot of instant feedback. Uh, so you can ask uh, participants just to show red or green cards or something. Have you understood this concept? And that alludes a little bit to the question I asked earlier um, in, in the main session about uh, getting feedback so you can adjust uh, as you go along uh, your your teaching and your training uh, methods and, and also the depth at which you need to cover different things. And I think traditionally we put too much stuff in our plans for each training uh, session. So there's not enough room to, to make adjustments or, or adjust to, to uh, questions you might get that you're not really prepared for in advance. It's a really, really good point. 
Can we move on to group, group four? Who's feeding back from group four? Hey, yes, uh, it's me, uh, Magdalena. Thank you. Uh, my group, uh, in my group, I was with um, Ellen. So thank you, Ellen, for taking notes. And also with Christina from Netherlands. And we have strong representation from Portugal with Pedro, uh, Emilia and uh, Paula. And uh, we discussed all the topics. Um, and um, uh, what was uh, very important uh, that um, moving from face-to-face -face, uh, trainings to online. It was a big uh, challenge, hard, but very interesting for uh, all our our, uh, our participation. Uh, what else? Uh, we uh, found a lot of advantages of online trainings, uh, like reducing um, number of hours uh, that we can share our trainings, materials, and sharing experience with worldwide uh, community. Uh, but the most interesting, I think, and a little bit different from uh, uh, other groups was our discussion about what do you mean by hybrid training? Is the hybrid training is the same as blended training or is completely different uh, approaches? What do you mean by hybrid? Do you mean that uh, the training is uh, online and face to face in the same time? Or do you mean that, for example, one day you go online and one day you're doing your face-to-face uh, -face, uh, time, face-to-face uh, -face training? So, and that's the that's that's the challenge. So, uh, Pedro he mentioned that uh, for for example, for uh, for 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 him, um, doing a conference uh, is possible to do a hybrid in the same time, like face to face and online. But if you are speaking about training workshops, that's very hard to uh, to organize uh, something uh, something like that. Uh, what we missed most from uh, from face to face is atmosphere, coffee breaks. Uh, we are social uh, animals, and we need to have coffee together, not uh, uh, under our screens. Um, yeah, and I think Ellen, would you mind to add something? I think the main thing uh, maybe is that uh, what was uh, Pedro insisting on that we uh, have all these new ways of, of, of sharing knowledge. So not only we will not accept anymore, uh, well, that's what he said. We will not accept anymore a conference where everybody is presenting slides and not doing something yes. um, engaging. But also online, we have these podcasts that were that were uh, uh, mentioned previously, but he also mentioned that in uh, in Portugal they use a lot of video tutorials and dip guides are of much more quality now because you know that people have to uh, use it also online without you uh, being around. And um, right. so Great. it does have a positive yeah. effect there too. Great, yeah. thanks. Exactly. We, got, we, we, got, uh, we had that, is that question about what do we actually mean by hybrid as well? Um, group five, who's feeding back? Do we have group five? Yes, we had group five. Yes. I'm feeding back. So basically a lot of elements that you already mentioned came up, so I'll not repeat all. But uh, what element that, that we really found uh, challenging is uh, that now as a trainers, we really need to know much more tools. Uh, than before because before you just you know made slides and went to the classroom and that was it and now you need to to know really a lot of tools for engagement in order to do that uh, I mean it's great to have videos and postcards but you also need to know how to do that so I think there are there are many many elements but it is uh, kind of implying much more kind of technical knowledge and support uh, in the online environment and just one element, uh, if you go down for, for the future, what, what, we, what we kind of notice is that online events are good for kind of uh, basic uh, talking. So when we are trying to do the, the basic awareness raising and engagement, but when you really want to do uh, a bit more with your audience, it still need to, you know, we will need to consider having a face-to-face -face event. And yes, we are also missing talking with our peers. And uh, that's kind of in short, I think, uh, 
people can read the, the, the notes. Great, thanks, Serena. So all the links to the notes are from the different groups are completely accessible. So please do take, take time to look at them if you want to. Um, we're just into the last few minutes. So Benka, if you could just put up the summary slide, please. As Irina mentioned right at the start, uh, we, we do want to, to capture what came out of today's session and, and give it back to, to the community in, a, in a, the form of a, of a blog post. Um, I'm very much looking for, for examples, as I said, for, for the online training handbook. So um, we've got a few, a few possible actions for you after today if you want to follow this up. Is, so please do look at the handbook, um, give me comments and suggestions. Um, the repo survey about your experiences moving online is still available. And if you'd like to get involved in repo, then you can do. Um, you could also join the Open Air Community of Practice. And we already mentioned the Orion, uh, the Orion final conference. Um, so I don't know if there's any other final comments just on the session today, maybe what we should do next. We've got a couple of minutes. It's a scope for we're getting us all together next and to do I'm still a human I see hand I'm still quite interested in really digging into what it means to deliver what's different or what's particularly problematic or what are the key issues around open science training specifically and not just online training in general Hugh yeah so uh this is a bit specific but I guess you know there's the community of practice and you know, I know we have some people from, from the States and so on, but if, you know, we have a regular slosh there, it would be nice to maybe use those slots to, to, to delve down into, into, into those things. I don't know, people, maybe people might feel a little bit uncomfortable, you know, about, 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 about using that. But yeah, I think there's that. And I think it was also noticeable is that in 18 months, people have gone from, you know, chalk and talk or, well, PowerPoints and so on, and face to face to online, a uh, sort of face to face live with Zooms and so on. And people, I think, feel kind of on top of more on top of that. But then using VLEs like Moodle and, and so on is uh, that's still a kind of a blank spot, I think. That's, that's, okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, you. Like a... Yes, I've said this many times. Some people, Irina, for example, knows this. Uh, I don't. I don't have a solution to this, but uh, this is what bothers me. We are still thinking about uh, in terms of translating uh, the experience that that we have from from our previous lives, from from the pre-pandemic period, uh, into an online environment. Uh, perhaps we should get involved uh, into some spontaneous uh, experiments and try to develop genuinely online tools uh, because uh, uh, I've, for example, I've, I've noticed that people get tired, they get easily tired of some games, uh, surveys uh, on Zoom, etc. And uh, they too easily uh, switch to spontaneous conversation when they have uh, when they have an opportunity. So perhaps we should try to invent something that is not uh, known and not created in our previous lives and the uh, live environment, uh, something completely new and, uh, and better suited to, to the online environment. Great, great idea. Okay, thanks. Okay, th thanks everyone. Um, just wanna wrap it up now. Uh, we're just, just after the hour. So thanks everybody. I so said the recording will be available and just say please do follow up the links and add to the notes um, if you like. Irina, is there anything else you need to say? No, oh, thanks a lot, Helen um, and Wencott for running this session and everyone. Uh, it was very interesting. Thank you so much and have a nice evening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.